I called over the workshop for the mayor and city council for the month of March. Oh, that's so cold. Ask Councilman Wentz to lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this frosty night. <laughs> we do have a long agenda this evening. Lit I always say that, but it's literally true this, this time. We're on an eight and a half by 14 page. But uh, we'll make, make it through, I'm sure. A lot of things, a lot of exciting things to talk about tonight, so we're I'm kind of looking forward to some of the discussion that we're going to have. Um, the first uh, order of business is to review the minutes for February the 6th, February the 11th, regular meetings, the February 9th special meeting, the February 27th budget workshop. Does anyone have any additions or corrections to any of those minutes? Goodness, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to remember. I can't That's believe that. Mm -hmm. Judy's, Judy has Judy something. Has okay. Didn't disappoint that. No, no, no. Well, and that's what I was trying to. In the um, February 11th draft, Clara, under the, where it says the approval of the minutes, and you just have a motion to approve the January 19th. <sighs> Wait a minute. Well, and that's it. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm a little confused. There's a lot of dates in there. So it, the, he had the approval of the January 14th was, was Brad and Joe. And then the special meeting was me with Brad, I believe. Yeah, I was looking at it. It was just, it was a little... Okay. What else? We'll be up for our approval on Monday night. And I suppose. Uh, we had uh, scheduled a, a presentation from the uh, Lions Club regarding their plans. Um, Creamery building and the uh, youth uh, athletic facility, but they uh, can't make it this evening, so we'll reschedule them at a future meeting, uh, either Monday or, or April meeting. I'm not sure which yet, but we'll. I, I was given a um, preview of that, and it's pretty nice. I think we'll like it. We'll have some discussion, I'm sure. All right, now it's time for public comment pertaining to non-agenda items. Anybody care to make a comment on anything that's not on the agenda? Please come up to the podium and announce your name and address, and <clears throat> you can speak for up to three minutes. Anyone care to come up and address anything on non-agenda? Barbara Cook, citizen from Clubside Drive. I'd like to talk about this letter that came in the mail. From the plan administrator in Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania. I looked up Cannonsburg and it's near Pittsburgh, and it says on my trusty map, said it says less than a thousand citizens. I just want to know a little bit about where this came from. And it looked really familiar to me. I seem to be getting these in the mail left and right the last few years. Mostly they pertain to utilities. 
electricity, telephone. I got a new one recently about my gutters and my downspouts. And now this one is about my septic and my sewer pipe. I don't have a septic, but I did for 50 years, so I know about them. And uh, it seems to me that what they're offering us that we can either buy or, buy or pay into, that we're paying taxes for this right now. And so this sewer line, members know the SLWA and his, it says that they partnered with you for some sort of a deal here. I don't know what it is. Oh, it's something for America. Well, I'm sure you are all aware that America starts at the at Arctic Circle and ends up in the Antarctic. We live in the United States of America. So it just seems to me like it's a big boondoggle and I don't know if, uh, I've never signed up for any of these with the phone company or the electric company, but, um, and I don't know if there's a legal term for a boondoggle, but I don't plan to sign up for it, and it doesn't look like it's a very good deal for any citizen. Barbara, if, if we can explain that. That's an insurance policy that they are offering you to protect your water lines from your home to the main uh, water line. Those, those connections are not covered by your tax dollars. They're not part of the city. And of course, in Carol Vista, I suppose the Condominium Association would be responsible for those. But it's just a solicitation that uh, someone is offering insurance to protect those lines in case they should fail. Jim, do you have any further comment on that? Um, the, the vendor did use the city's logo with permission. Um, there's a program through the Maryland Municipal League, basically, that, that partners with the, uh, the insurance company, the warranty company that's sending out the mailings. And as the mayor said, the, the city maintains the, uh, the main lines, um, which are usually between the sidewalks and the streets or under the streets. Um, the homeowners are responsible for the lateral lines that connect the home to the sewer mains. So if something were to happen, a blockage or a breakage or something like that in those lines, the homeowner would be responsible. The city doesn't maintain those. But it, it certainly is up to the homeowner whether they want to you know, purchase the warranty or not. So that's, that's what the, um, the, the uh, Let's see, I'm not sure if it's called Service Line Warranty America. That's what that, that's the nutshell version, so. Okay, anyone else? Barbara Bridle, 435 East Baltimore Street. As a member of the election board, I feel compelled to address statements you made, Councilman Frazier, at the February 11th council meeting accusing the Board of Elections of harassment. First, a poll watcher is just that, a watcher. They are not to speak to anyone or interfere with the election in any way, such as asking questions of the board or trying to tell the board what they should be doing. A poll watcher is given the procedures to be followed, and if they do not comply, they are reminded again of what they can and cannot do. During the last election period, we had to remind poll watchers of these rules many times. This is not harassment. I worked as a poll watcher during a gubernatorial election, and frankly, I thought we allowed our poll watchers too many liberties. All I was allowed to do was sit and watch in a corner. No speaking, looking at voting machines, talking, taking notes, doing anything. Second, electioneering has to be done 100 feet from the polling place. There were some people who tried to electioneer inside the polling place and were asked to leave. And there were some outside asked to move because they were too close to the polls. This is not harassment either. It's called following the rules. And we abide by the same rules as the Carroll County Board of Elections. And last, I personally was offended. 
Councilman Frazier, by you publicly falsely accusing me and my fellow election board members of harassment or any wrongdoing. Once again, you fail to present the correct facts. When you do that, you cause voters to lose faith and distrust in the election process. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I guess we can. One more. All right, we have another comment. Okay. Robin Frazier, 142 Bentley Street. I wasn't going to say anything, but um, I was a poll watcher. And I've been a poll watcher in the past and was uh, allowed to stand behind the uh, folks that were checking people in because that's the purpose, is that you watch to see who's being checked in and you take notes. Uh, as a poll watcher in Tawnytown, I had to sit up against the wall with a chain in front of me as if I was an animal in a cage. And um, I, when I couldn't really watch what was going on. All I could do was listen and take notes. And even then, if somebody showed their license, uh, I asked the poll watchers, would they please read those out loudly? And they said, no, they would not. So then I couldn't see or hear what was going on. Um, so I think there are lots of complaints about what went on at the polls. Um, and uh, the report from the election board focused on poll watchers when it should have focused on things like people coming out of the booth with more than one ballot saying, hey, I got two of these, I don't think I'm supposed to have them. And people being turned away from the polls when they shouldn't have been and didn't get to vote properly. So uh, I would say that uh, there are, are some improvements to be made there. Thank you. All right, I need to ask the council if there's any uh, conflicts of interest on the agendas items tonight no sir. No, sir. no sir poll watchers have the right to look at the poll book and councilman frazier you're, being, you're out of order we're, we're out of order who's been, been checked we're moving into on. Yeah. moving on we're not commenting on the the comments we're just moving on they, people are free to make comments but we don't comment on them all right um it's in the state statute Next is uh, introduction for ordinance number 02209-2019, the fiscal year budget to 2020 budget ordinance. Anybody have any questions on that ordinance? Also for introduction on Monday will be ordinance 03-2019. Chapter 94, Installation and Operation of Small Wireless Telecommunication Facilities in Public Right-of-Ways. Do I have any comments or questions on this? I, uh, oh, I'm <laughs> <not teasing. laughs> I assume this new copy is different from the one that we or is it had in our council right. pack. The new copy uh, incorporates the changes. You should have this. Uh -huh. See that the, where it, the one line shows you what was there and what has changed. The new copy has all the changes in it. Okay. So if you want to know what was changed, it's this one line sheet, one piece sheet. Okay. We'll get you that if you don't have that. that. So. Um, I now think uh, has a plethora of stuff. I have a <laughs> I have a couple of questions. I think everybody's going to end up hating me after this, but. That, that's all right. Um, so I, I read through this and uh, you know, I have a couple of questions. Some of them are maybe more, more easy or simple to answer than others, but you know, with everybody's permission, I'll keep going until you, know, you tell me to be quiet or unless anybody else has any comments on it in the meantime. Um, so, so, so I guess my first question has to do with the, the ordinance overall. I mean, I know this is directed toward uh, wireless facilities that are gonna be in public rights of way uh, but are there any options or opportunities uh, for us to protect buildings or properties that aren't in the right of way? Because if the, if the wireless industry gets the legislation they want, then if you have a property that is not considered single family residential and you're outside of the right of way, you would face the, the risk of having one of these erected in front of your house or, or wherever. Okay. To not go back too far, but we're all familiar with that this is going to be small cell deployment. It's a 5G deployment that we've been talking about for about a year now. 
if there's any other type of deployment, so if it's on private property and it's a cell tower, for example, something like that, that's already covered in our code, other the zoning laws and the site plans and things like that. Similar to when the city puts like a cell tower on its water tower. So, so. so the small cell deployments are gonna be made up of basically two components, an antenna and then the box, the stuff that goes with it. The antenna goes up on top of a pole and the box goes somewhere else. It doesn't go up on top. That whole installation right now is attempted to be put in the right of way because uh, that's where they want to focus. They're using the, and when I mean public right of way, it's the right of way that's either owned by the state, the county, or the, the city uh, that is along the streets. While they could put it on private property, they could do that only if they negotiate with the private property owner. So they would go to a private property owner and say, I'd like to mount this on your building. What would it cost? And, and you work out an arrangement. If they did that, that would still be covered by the city's ordinances. It would be covered by the content of this that deals with like the aesthetics and the placement, but it wouldn't be covered with the right of way stores issues and so what you're saying in a long short is that yes it's covered if people want to put it on private property it's unlikely that they're going to want to try to do that because this type of technology has to be installed at such close intervals that it becomes expensive for them to start negotiating with like every seventh property owner to do it which is why they want to do it in the existing right of way and the fees that are charged, and we can get into that some other time, but the fees that are charged for the public right-of-way are <coughs> very low, 200 and I think it's $70, $260. Whereas if you were going to put it on somebody's house, you can imagine the market would be, okay, well, you're going to charge a rent type of situation. That answers your question. It does. It does. Thank you. Um, so going to page two. Um, uh, letter E talking about and if I'm not saying this if I'm not pronouncing this correctly, please uh, please do correct me uh, Co-locate am co I saying that correctly? And then uh, the very last line of, of letter E where you talk about co-location has a corresponding meaning What is the corresponding meaning and what exactly does that mean in general? Okay, so what you're referring to is the definition section and the definition of co-locate just so we're clear co-locate is spelled two different ways it's co-locate or it's c-o-l-l-o-c-a-t-e but they're both called co-locate what that means is um, if you have a fixture like a pole in the in the ground you're encouraging the cellular companies to put multiple cells multiple antennas multiple sites on one pole instead of having a pole for, and I'm making the names up, Sprint and a pole for AT&T and a pole for Verizon, you wanna to try to encourage them to co-locate on one existing thing to stop the clutter. So co-locate, I guess, would be the um, verb, and then when it says co-location has a corresponding meaning, I guess that's the noun form of what that would be. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Then on uh, page three, uh, under letter Q, still in the definition section, uh, you, we talk about adding, or I'm sorry, expanding a uh, expanding a compound. And could you explain a little bit more about what a compound is and, and what would be expanded to qualify under this? Okay, so this ordinance is obviously prospective. We don't have any right now. So when the first person comes in, they're going to file an application, and we'll just call it a new application, and they. They go through the process and they put their compound up, which would mean their antenna, their ground structure, ground structure in quotes, okay? They put all that together and it's there. Now, at some point in the future, they come back and they say, we need to change that, okay? They can come in and do any type of repair they want. They can do any type of replacement they want, as long as they don't change, and I'm gonna use the word footprint, but I don't mean it on the ground, okay? But as long as they don't change the space where they are. So for example, and this is made up, if the box that houses all the guts, the cabinet, is big enough for them to put more things in without expanding the outside, they'd be okay. But if they come in and they say, no, it's five years down the road and the technology is different now. We need a, 
a bigger box to accommodate the technology, kind of like the monitors on your desk. You know, you have a bigger monitor than you used to. We need to move things around. Then that would be a modification. And we want to scrutinize modifications because we scrutinize the initial placement to make sure that it was all in the aesthetics that we want. So if you find the idea is that when you put one in, it gets reviewed. If you come in to do maintenance repair and it doesn't change any of the structure, not just the function, but the structure of what it is, then you're okay. But if you come in and you're modifying it, then it's going to be treated more like an initial one where you have to go through the review again. Thank you very much for that. On, uh, on page four, um, letter Z and letter AA still in the definition section. We talk about, and going off of what you just said, I guess, too, we talk about new visible burdens and we talk in letter AA uh, about something that is being substantially similar in design. Is the language in that intentionally vague to allow for flexibility or is it, you know, something that we need to, to strengthen? It's vague on purpose because the 5G technology, even the carriers, even the providers, really don't know how they're doing it yet. So we know that it's going to require an antenna and some ground things, but the idea is we want to make sure that if any maintenance, repairs, replacements, that it's vague enough that we can come in and say, okay, that's different. And what you're going to have to kind of compare it to is the technology we have today. I mean, so when you first had your first cell phone, right, it was in a bag, and now it's this big. So technology changes. We're trying to make sure that we can accommodate when their technology changes going down the road. And that, that's the flexibility, right? Right. And that plays into what I talked about with maintenance and repairs versus replacement, because when you get to the nuts and bolts of this, who it applies to is in the section 94-2 or point two, which basically says, for prior to any construction, installation, or other work performed other than ordinary maintenance and repairs, you have to get, you have to do all these things. So that's why we carve that out. Gotcha. Um, and then for uh, letter BB right underneath of that, uh, where it talks about the definition for a small wireless facility, just kind of curious about you know where that originates and what happens if a company tries to claim because in there we talk about how it can't be higher than 30 feet, but what happens if a company comes in and says, well, mine is 35 feet, but it still counts as a small wireless, or would yeah. not count under this? This is simple and complex. We'll go, if, if you're happy with the simple answer, I can say this copies the model that basically is defined by the FCC. However, it's changed to apply to our town, other towns, with the, the numbers. So the 30 feet that you quoted here, that structures on an antenna can be mounted 30 feet or less in height. Some places might be 40 feet. Some places might be 50 feet. I mean, that number changes. If, a, if an applicant comes in, they can't do this unless they meet these requirements because we're allowing small wireless facilities in the right of way, and we're defining what they are. Now, the number, the 30 feet, you know, you could say, well, it could be, you can make it any number. But here's the calculations of why it's this way. Um, obviously, you would figure it's not going to be good to have it at chest height, face height, of walking down the street. They need it to be a little bit higher than that. Okay? And they probably would prefer higher than 30 feet because they get more of a broadcast. But there's something called collapse calculations. Okay? You're getting beyond the engineering here. But when you have a pole and you have stuff on it, when it collapses, it falls in certain directions, and sometimes they can be made to collapse on themselves and things like that, okay? Instead of trying to figure that out for every single placement here, later on in the ordinance, we say, you can't put this, it has to be a 40-foot setback from residential, stru from, from structures, not residential, from structures. Now, obviously, that's not going to work in some places, and we'd have to figure that out, but I can't do engineering, but I can do geometry a little bit. So if you figure that the height is 30 feet and the setback's 40 feet, you can do the Pythagorean theorem and realize <laughs> that that's a simple way of making sure it's not going to fall on anything. Right. And the theory then would be, let's say they want to put one in a place that doesn't have a 40-foot setback. They can't make it, like right down here in Main Street like that. Well, then the, the, the uh, 
the city through its governing bodies, the planning commission, the city manager, could say, all right, I need you to do an engineering study on the collapse. It's not called collapse something, but it, that you get the idea. So that somebody comes in and does the diagram and says, this is how it works. So um, that helps. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. Um, then skipping ahead uh, to page seven, uh, item number 15, uh, where it talks about uh, application submissions and then uh, line 16, where it talks about the abandonment of uh, applications. So I'm, I'm noticing that you know, we have a 30-day window uh, to deal with a lot of these things. Uh, but then you know, the company, if we need more information from them or you know, the time it takes for us to consider that, well, they haven't finished the application or they are, they're refusing to complete it or whatever the case is, is 90 days. Uh, is 90 days a pretty reasonable amount of time or should it be something less to ensure that you know, the company's being as responsive to them as they would expect us to be to them? Well, here's the, here's the theory. And, and before we're done, we probably should talk about the FCC and what's going on and things like that. But as a matter of law of the land in the US right now, the FCC has set what they call shot clocks. So that's what they're referred to. And basically it says that the city has 30 days from the time it receives an application to determine whether the application is incomplete or not. So that's where you see your number 15, where it has the 30 day time period. So for example, if you're not turning in your best homework, the city goes through and says, you need to redo this. The shot clock is stopped. They turn it back on and you can see 15 says, and when we review your stuff, it starts again. Obviously, if we took 30 days to review it and we get it back to them on day 31, they're going to need a, some time to fix it. You know, maybe it's something minor, but maybe it's something major. So the idea is you need to set a cap so that we can say that application is gone, it's abandoned, if you don't respond within a period of time. It could be something complicated, like with the fall thing that I just said with the poles. You know, they can't turn that around in a day. They need an engineer. They need to do this. They need to do that. So 30 days is our time period. And then the overall shot clock is 60 days to make a decision. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that if the 30 days, they're good, that we pursue it on a rapid time period because we have to make a decision within the 60 days from the very beginning. So we want it to be out at some point in time. So 90 days seemed like a reasonable time. Okay. 45 probably is too short. 60 could be okay, but 60 and 60 gets confusing. 60 days to approve, 60 days to abandon. So you can pick whatever date you want, probably over 60 days. Well, I mean, if you're, if you're <coughs> recommending 90, then you know, personally, I have no concern with that whatsoever. That's so. in the, the draft. Uh, and when we're done, I can tell you about how this came about. Okay. So, uh, that's in the model draft. Okay. Um, if we go ahead to page eight then, um, where it talks about the information that has to be supplied on applications. Uh, for example, uh, number 20, right? What if there's a situation where a company submits uh, information that is accidentally incorrect or intentionally incorrect? Is that something that we send back to the company and say, no, you have to correct this, or is there some other kind of process that's employed at that point? So the language you're talking about, it makes it sound uh, pretty hefty because it says, uh, have the authority to bind and commit the applicant attesting to the truthfulness, completeness, and accuracy of the information presented. So obviously people, it's complex applications, there can be mistakes, omissions, errors, and stuff. All that means is, is that when you're signing on to this, you're saying that this is our application. So let me use some technical legal terms, this and that. They basically want to build this, which means they can't build that. And if they try to build that, we're going to go to the application and saying, hey, you wanted to build this. It sounds like Abbott and Costello now, right? <laughs> no, but it makes sense. It That's makes the sense. idea is that you've signed the application stating this is what you're going to build. And we would approve the application. Let's say it's perfect. We don't expect to go out and see them starting to construct something different because they signed saying that was what it was. And they can't come back and say, well, it was an approximation. We're saying it's accurate, it's truthful, it's complete. Awesome. Thank you for that, too. Uh, 
Now, if we can skip ahead to uh, page 10. Um, in uh, number two, uh, we're talk I'm sorry, right above number two in letter E, where it talks about the applicant is disclosing and writing any other agreements that might have some kind of bearing on it. Um, I'm, I'm worried that maybe, perhaps, and again, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, but if they say, like, oh, we have something, um, I, I guess maybe the best way to put it is, does that have anything to do with co-location? Would they be able to say this right. direct? That, that's a good pickup there. That's a, a good thing. This is directly related to that. So let me read the language so we're all clear. It's, the applicant shall disclose in writing any agreement in existence that would limit or preclude the ability of the applicant to share any new telecommunication tower or support structure that it constructs or has constructed for it. So what we're talking about is, again, there's an encouragement through co-location. Okay? We, we encourage several things kind of like in an order. The first thing we encourage is stealth technology in there, where it's kind of hidden. And the second thing we would try to encourage is undergrounding the ground stuff, if that's possible. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. The third thing we would encourage would be co-location. We already talked about what that meant. So this one basically says is when somebody comes in and wants to build a pole, a structure, or something like that, they need to show us up front whether there's any problems with other people connecting. So let's say that applicant A comes in and says, this is it. They don't show us any agreement or anything that can't be, have a co-location there. When applicant B comes in, we're going to tell applicant B, you need to go see applicant A and see if you can put it on their pole instead of putting a pole right next to it. So you're kind of boxing them in up front to say, is there going to be a problem? And you have to kind of remember that the poles, the antennas, the things like that, they're not applied for and probably not even owned by the, na the, the carriers you can name, Verizon, Sprint, those kind of things. They're owned by like utility contracting companies. They're the ones that come in, put them up, put them together, and then turn around to these companies and say, do you want to put your antennas on my pole? That type of thing. So that's what you're trying to do is make sure that there's not going to be some agreement that they say, oh, well, we can't let other people connect. We'd be able to go back to their application and say, you needed to state that up front. And is that something that we would be encouraging, that we would want them to have that option of co-location to minimize other companies that would come in and say, hey, we also want to put a small cell tower in? Yes. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, and you know, this step back a couple steps here, is that this is probably the next step in technology. Okay, and it'll probably make our lives a lot better in the long run. Right. But the transition, just like anything else, is painful. And so we're resistant to want any of this, right? I like the way it is. I don't want to have to figure out what it's going to look like. So the idea is, I know we can't say no, because the FCC said that, so I want to minimize it, right? right? So if I got to take one, one's better than 10. That's the idea of co-location. But you could also come up with the argument is, is it going to look like a Christmas tree? Because that's going to look terrible too. But you get the idea of what we're trying to do. Right. And, and, and that makes perfect sense. Because I mean, I've, I've, I'm sure you've seen pictures of these things and they can really get, you know. Well, that's what I mean by right. Christmas tree. Not literally a Christmas tree, but like all these antennas hanging off of one thing. It doesn't look unsightly for the rest of the block, but if you live there, it's not a very good thing to do. So that's not what this tries to encourage. The problem we have technology-wise, is that these things interfere with each other, allegedly, supposedly. So the idea is this person and this person may not be able to be on the same pole. We want that demonstrated, that if you can't, that's why you're going to put a pole five feet away. We want to know that that can't happen. So it's kind of like magnets. They would kind of, what, they would work against each other rather than... I mean, I could make that up. I, I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would imagine it's when you had the rabbit ears and the TV went fuzzy. But, you know, it's, that's before your time. So. All right. Um, let's see. So on uh, <laughs> that, thank you for that, too. Um, I promise I only have a couple more questions. I promise. Um, so uh, on page 11, you had mentioned earlier talking about the, uh, the fees. There's like a fee cap that would be about $270 or so. Could you... Could you go into a little bit more about, you know, the whole fee process, why it's you know, only 270 or, or... Okay. And at the end, if you don't ask me, I do want to talk about the state, the Fed, how it all works out together. 
So the FCC has said you cannot, as a municipality, as a local government, charge more than $270 fee for using the right of way. So you have to kind of look at it and say, well, why would we charge anything? That's the public's, okay? The public owns that. We're the custodians of the public. If you look at your cable bill, uh, there you pay a franchise fee through your cable bill that's paid for using all the public right of way. It's paid to the local governments that belong to that. So that's the theory behind that. And so when this thing firstly, first ran out, probably a year and a half ago when these started to get deployed, people, the municipal governments looked at this as a, a big cash cow. It's like, we're gonna be able to rent the right of way again. Because that's the way cell towers were. Remember, we had a water tower out here that nobody did anything with, and all of a sudden people wanted to put cell towers, and they pay the city thousands of dollars every year. So here's our next opportunity to do this. And the industry, they were gouged. I mean, it's not the industry's fault. I mean, there were places that said, oh, it's $15,000 a pole. And they said, you know, that's not sustainable. So they went to the FCC, and we'll talk about why, and the FCC said it's $270 a pole. So the pendulum went from this side to over here. So this list, it's not really a list, but on this page it shows there's a right-of-way user fee. So you're gonna, re you're gonna obtain up to $270. There's also the other fees that we may have to have. And when they're, when they're, they're not necessarily fees in the way that you think, they're cost reimbursements, like a developer does. So if an engineer, our engineer has to review that, the legal department has to prepare a right-of-way agreement. That's not limited to $270. They pay the cost of doing that, but they pay $270 for a fee. So, so basically, there's the fee, and then there's extra costs associated with whatever may be involved in putting up the tower. Right. If you want to do it really good government style, <coughs> the fee is to compensate the citizens for the use of their right-of-way and also to compensate the city staff who can't charge per hour per task for their time and involvement in this. And do you have, I mean, if you don't know this, that's, that, that's perfectly okay. Do you have any idea where the 270 figure came from? Like who sat down and said, this is the perfect computation for a fee? Of uh, bureaucrats. These came out of the FCC with um, Dallas and the city of Dallas, someplace in Colorado. I mean, that was the cases that got talked about with this. Yeah. All right, thank you. I, uh, just two more questions, That's, I promise. I should also uh, make a note that on page 14, I had to switch highlighters. <laughs> and then, so uh, in the, uh, I know I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but I think this directly relates to, at least I think it might relate to what we're talking about. In our IT department report under number eight, uh, Dan talks about how uh, we have Sprint and T-Mobile uh, cell tower proposals that are in review. Uh, do those have anything to do with the wireless service covered in this? No, no I, I haven't seen the report, but I'm helping him renegotiate those. Those are the cell towers that are on the water tanks. Okay, got it. Thank you. And then the, uh, the last question is maybe a little humorous, but uh, do, does our ordinance comply with these new bird-safe building regulations of the state? <laughs> well, there'll be more places for him to sit, I guess. <laughs> Uh, that is, <laughs> no, that was bad. If I can um, talk a little bit just so we're all clear on the, the shifting sands here and why we're doing this, because I want to refresh her so everybody understands. We changed the zoning law about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, to make sure that poles are now covered. Because back in the day, a pole was a pole, a fence pole or whatever pole, <clears throat> and they were exempt from zoning. But now all of a sudden, poles have meaning. So we defined it in our zoning code. I mean, we didn't say pole, but it was defined. And it said, if you're gonna do these things, you gotta comply with the zone and you gotta go through the site plan process. So that's what we did. And if you recall, we referred to, and you have to follow the requirements of chapter 94. And we had no chapter 94 and we hadn't for a while. And the reason we didn't have it for a while is because everybody was still fighting. The dust hadn't settled and the dust really hasn't settled, but the feds put another time period on. They said that by April 15th, if local governments don't adopt aesthetic standards for this, they won't be able to apply them later. So that's why, as I told you a month or so ago, that this was coming out. It's going to be our best effort, and we can change it as we go later, but we need to have something by April 15th. 
And the aesthetic standards are in here. They don't sound like things we would want to read, distances, times, cubic feet, but that's what they mean by that. So the FCC made these rulings, and they had several planks that they said. First of all, the fees we talked about, the shot clock we talked about, we talked about the aesthetic standards, and um, the la we cannot prohibit this. Okay? There is no way to prohibit this from happening. We have to accommodate the industry while we're still applying these things. So you can't just say, no, we're not doing it. That, that doesn't work. Okay? So that's what the FCC came out, and of course, the big cities have filed appeals to these FCC decisions that are pending in federal court. But as far as we're concerned, there's no stay, which means these rules apply. And that's what we're playing with, the FCC rules and our rules. In, no, I'm sorry. Okay. In the meantime, then, the state, the legislature, has gotten involved in the act. We knew they were going to because they talked about it last year, kind of a blanket, um, a blanket prohibition taking local authority away from anyone from doing it. Right. And last year, it didn't really go anywhere. They said it was going to go to summer study. And there's two sides, and it, you can paint them however you want, the industry side and the community side, the good government side, right? And the industry side basically wants to codify the federal regulations in Maryland, meaning that if the federal regulations get overturned in court, it wouldn't apply here, okay? And they basically want, the biggest thing is an automatic approval, meaning that if you don't meet the time in the shot clock, it's automatically approved the way it was submitted. And you can see that would cause lots of fighting because we rarely ever get perfect work. So they will always be saying, well, you know, I approved it and you didn't do this. So that's the major part of the industry bill problem. The community bill wants to change the language to allow local control to continue to have local control up to what the FCC is letting you have. Okay, so there's, there's that kind of play. And of course, the bills are just having hearings. There's still, there's a House bill, there's a Senate bill, there's all that going on. You know, session's not over till the first week of April. The bills don't take effect, best case, if they pass until July, which is way after the April deadline. So you, we gotta play with the cards we're dealt at this point in time. So that's kind of how it all works out. One of the provisions that we didn't talk about in here is the local notice provision that is added. That's an unusual one, but we talked about this at the planning commission level, not related to this project, so to speak, but this is more akin to getting a permit than getting permission to build something. And you know the planning commission and you all, you don't hear about permits. You don't hear about the guy that came in to get a zoning certificate or a permit to install something because they're basically complying with the existing law and the city manager reviews it and says permits issued. This is a little different, at least we thought, in the fact that they could get a permit and it'll be installed right in front of your house. And remember, 30 feet is right in front of your second floor window. Right. right. <laughs> now, the reality of the situation is you can't say no, but you can accommodate them. Maybe it shouldn't be in front of historic structures. Maybe there's a whole lots of maybes, 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 but there's things that need to be reviewed. It shouldn't just be I come and get my permit and I sign off on it. So one of the things we built in here is a notice requirement where the applicant has to give notice, and I forget what we said, but it was a, a radius. I think it was like, what is it, 300, 300 feet, feet 200 feet. I mean, it was a significant <laughs> radius around where the pole or their, their installation would be. And they got to notify all the property owners around there that this is what we're going to do. And then the city would have some type of public information meeting at the planning commission level. Planning commission is probably the people that are going to do this. And you have to really set the expectations for the citizens and the fact that you can imagine you're the planning commission, the applicant's over there explaining what they want to do. There might be some things that you can work out with each other and change. But at the end of the day, it's not going to be a vote where it's like you're disapproved or you're approved. Remember, if they meet the requirements, they get it as a permit. So we're trying to make it so that the citizens understand that things could be happening in their house and have the ability to come out because they know it better than we do. I mean, they look out their window, they know what's there better than you do, so they can come and tell you, this would really be a problem because this is where my water meter vault is, and if they want to do that, I won't be able to fix my water line, or I don't have any other parking spaces, and I won't be opening the door to the car because it's going to hit this. Who knows what this is? But, 
but it's going to give an opportunity to say that so that things can be incorporated in it. Protecting the rights of the individual on the property. Right. right. The, the horror stories happened in Potomac about a year ago, because this has been around. It's just getting to us, you know, in less populated areas. The people in Potomac were away on vacation, and when they came home, there was a pole in front of their house. It was all legit. They didn't have any of these <clears throat> issues in any of that place. Of course, there was a big lawsuit after that. We don't want that. You know, we want to be able to, you know, and supposedly, remember, this is supposed to make life better for us. 5G service is going to be better. For, you know, it's where things move to. But the reality is the transition of how, and that's the thing that we've got to remember, is that the industry itself doesn't really know how it's going to deploy this. It may be some time before we ever see this here. You can see them in Westminster, but it's a, they do it for profit. So it's cost effective of whether or not they can make these installs and they have enough. To, and it's for bandwidth, for broadband, for, for data. Okay, it's not cell. We keep saying cell. It's not for talking. It's all for data broadband stuff. So I have one, la I promise, this is the last question because what Jay just talked about was very interesting. So uh, with the FCC order being as vague as it is, because I know it wants to not get into the particulars of certain things and leave those things up to the states, which is, I guess, where we're at right now in Maryland where the the wireless industry is pushing, you know, a certain set of things they want to see in the legislation. Um, let's say that this year um, the uh, no legislation in the state ends up going through. So these, and would that, are, is it that the companies are waiting for this legislation to go through before they begin dealing with towns, or is it they're they're waiting or? They want the legislation to go through before they deal with towns, but if it doesn't, would they still come to us anyway to try to deal with this, even without that legislation? Meaning that the FCC's ruling would be the only thing that was standing. And so they said, okay, well, Annapolis didn't push this through this year, so we want to go deal with the towns directly. Is there anything that would prevent them from doing that? No. They've already done this. Like, Baltimore City has like 15,000 of these okay. already. So, I mean, it, it's, they're, they're, deployed, they're deployed there, and they have to have them almost every block to do that. Okay, so Mr. has some. The idea is they could still come, and they have come to us. It's probably been a year and a half or two years ago where they came in and showed us what they wanted to do, and they wanted to do these installs, and we kept working with them, and they were agreeable. We said, you know, we don't have any regulations yet to even deal with this. Let us put them in place. Right. And okay. the personnel changed. They were still interested. They weren't interested. Uh, the reality of this, another thing that comes to mind, is if this is going to be installed within the corporate limits of the city, this applies. It does not have to be in the city's right of way. Okay, so right out here, state highway right of way, if there is one, that's where this would still apply because you're doing it in the corporate limits. So this is protecting us no matter what, as much as we can it's be. It's the best protection that we can come up with, and I would imagine that you'll see that when you have somebody come in and try to go through this with you, you'll be saying, we need to make some changes. It's not really workable just like everything else. Or if the state passes a law, we'll need to make changes on that. Or if the FCC changes. The FCC cases were decided under the Obama administration. And then when the Trump administration came in, the FCC changed and overturned a lot of their things. They didn't really overturn it. They threw those cases out and new cases were filed. And so there's a whole dynamic going on with that too. And is that kind of why they were, like, it's vague under President Trump, but it was not as vague under President Obama? It's like that it different It was more broad clause. under President Obama in the fact that the industry, there was no more, there's not that many regulations. Like the pendulum, there wasn't that many regulations. And so now they've come in and said, well, now we're going to regulate. And regulation is probably the wrong word, but st structure or something. I promise that's the end of my questions. It, th thank Jay. Thank you very much. Can I ask a question? There couldn't possibly be any more I questions. Gonna, I know. Believe it or not. I'm going to need another bottle of water. And I'm going to have to ask Jill where this is because I didn't actually read the entire thing. Um, but is there anything that kind of touches to the long? I mean, like we have a lot of stuff in here that says, you know, it should have the match the pole color, the finish. This has to be done. What about long term when they start rusting or it doesn't actually interfere with? what they do, but they just start to look run down. Do we have anything to stand on as far as saying come in and make this pretty again? Yes. That's a good question. It's in the back okay. somewhere. I, I wouldn't be able to put my finger there, on it. But there is something in it. We, and I, I mean, I want to make sure. I, I'd like to tell you all about it since I was really invested in doing this, but <laughs> I'm sure this is enough. There's provisions in here for bonding, and you're okay. very familiar with bonding. 
but it's not like that. It's not, remember, when we bond a development, we're saying you need to build this and guarantee it's good because it's a public infrastructure, stormwater, sewer, and stuff. These are their towers or poles or antennas. If they don't work, we don't really care. We just want them to look right and not fall off the pole and that type of thing. But the bonds are going to be posted so that if they destroy the public right of way, they cut up the sidewalk, they cut up the street, they do with those things, that we have money in place to go in and fix it as opposed to hoping they come and fix it. Okay. Utility contractors are really notorious for just ripping things up. And so that's why this is done in that way. And then there is a provision in the back for abandonment. And, and the mayor had asked some questions about that earlier uh, offline and basically saying, um, if we tell them, because remember, they're in the public right of way. So, and I, I'm making this up so you can find fault with it, but let's say there's one in the public right of way and that's where the water line is. And now we have a huge water main break or we want to add a water line connection or we want to do something in that area and this pole's in the way. There's provisions in there where we give them 30 days notice and they have to remove this stuff. There's also provisions in there that I, I, I really like where it's like in the case of emergency, we can just cut the poles down and stuff like that. I mean, <laughs> don't do that tomorrow. But the last thing I'd say, because this is not my favorite subject, you all made it my favorite subject, okay, <laughs> is that how did this ordinance get drafted? There were, there is the National League of Cities model ordinance, and Mayor Pro Tem Foster got that for us. There is the Ohio model that's being called, because this applies all over the country, right? Mm -hmm. And the Ohio model was, hap was, was a very good one because it had the aesthetic design standards that can be incorporated in that. There was the Gaithersburg model, which you remember we all tried to start using. It was about that thick, and that was just impossible to deal with because they d regulated everything in the right of way, just not this. And then there is the Martin's Edition model, which is the Montgomery County model, which was a slimmed down version of this. And there's probably one more that I, there was five. And so what we did is we took them all and we picked the best ones because you get thrown out of college for plagiarizing, but <laughs> here you get a bonus for doing it by doing it, that type of thing. So we took the best ones of all the ones that would apply and put them together and tried to make it work with what we have. So you're probably not going to find another one exactly like this, but there'll be parts that will be like, oh, that looks familiar, and something like that. And we stopped eventually, because every week there's another person to drafting one, and we eventually said, you know, we're going to stop with five, or we could do this constantly. So, so should I call you Mary Shelley at this point? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I really do appreciate this dialogue. It's very helpful. It's a very complex subject. It's something that we're all nervous about. And I think the um, interchange here tonight was, uh, was very beneficial. So thank you both Joe and Jay and Judy for those uh, Thank comments. you, Jay. Yeah, I'm good, Mayor, I promise now. <laughs> I will ask if there's any other comments, but I hope there's not. All right. That will be up for introduction on Monday night. And also, uh, Ordinance 04-2019, Fiscal Year Water and Sewer Rate. Any questions on that? Yes, I would like to um, address um, the water sewer rate. Um, I produced a document in the last election cycle. It looked like this, how to reduce water and sewer rates in Tawnytown at the request of Henry Hine. And um, it says here that the uh, the on page 10 of that document. This is the debt service payoff um, schedule that goes from 19, 2019 to 2032. And I had asked in the last meeting whether and what the payoff was for the 1998 bond. It was a $360,000 bond that was paid off uh, uh, when we talked to Barry at the last um, February 28th meeting. Well, the Davenport report shows that a 3% a reduction in the sewer rate equals about $120,000. So given that data from our, our auditor uh, from the last election, that would be a reduction of about $0.09 cents on the sewer rate just because we paid off this one 
debt. Now I've submitted a list of questions for uh, for the city manager to look at and just finish those up today. So maybe I'll have them by Monday. But I think that there, I was glad to hear Councilman Bigliotti ask the question about rates. I mean, I think it's very possible with the amount of growth we have to look at the sewer rate reduction. The um, sewer rate is um, the m major portion of most people's water sewer bill, and a lot of it has to do with the citizens having to fund the, the pumping station, the transfer station over here. It's a $3 million financing. I thought that the developers of Meads Crossing should have to do that, but Mr. Mayor, I would just submit that uh, on Monday, it would be good timing to give a reduction at least for the amount of the the bond payoff that we did from 1998 in the sewer rate. I think we had a discussion during the- Nine, per, nine percent? I think we had a discussion during the budget planning session that outlined some capital improvement costs that were quite substantial and we felt that it was not a proper time to reduce rates. But um, and even in you know the, even in light of the fact that some of our bills are being paid off, I don't have any problem with uh, our city manager uh, looking over the questions you gave him. But I I think we've already had this discussion, unless I'm missing something. No, I think we decided since we're still taking from fund balance to cover especially the capital projects that are absolutely necessary to do. In fact, we're overdue for them. We decided that keeping them, keeping the rates where they are, was the most appropriate thing. Yeah, that's, that's 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 what I thought we got the, from. That's it. the discussion I remember. Okay. Well, I would suggest that now is a good time with the growth that's coming. I've asked <laughs> questions uh, in writing uh, about the uh, revenues that have come in from all the new building. I took a time coming up uh, Keenan Street to look at all the new house hookups at fourteen thousand four hundred dollars a piece and do the calculations that we did back here, there was room there to go down five cents, and Joe, you led the charge on that. Well, again, Monday, uh, I certainly would like to see some relief for folks that are you're suffering under these rates. You're missing the point that we just stated that required infrastructure upgrades are necessary, and we, we can't do both, I guess we could lower the insurance or lower the rates and not do the infrastructure upgrades. But I'm not sure that's prudent. And I think that's what the body decided during our budget session last week. There was a rough dis discussion on the 27th about the presentation that was made when we first got that. But now we're going to have to vote on it on Monday. And I think from the interviewing of the constituents I've had, people are looking for reductions in rates since there's so much growth. I think most people well, from a practical standpoint, once they know the whole story, would certainly side on the, the side of improving our infrastructure rather than just letting it deteriorate until it's no longer functional. Well, I think we restricted funds for infrastructure improvements you're talking about. These are new revenues that have come in through growth, and I think it's time to give back some of that to the, to the rate payer. Okay, thanks. Well, Councilman, the, some of that new growth is going to help pay our expenses. We're at a point now where we're not having to borrow from the reserves to meet our expenses. And so what we're able to use the reserve for is to pay, as Councilman Wentz noted, capital projects. That means that this is money that's not gonna come at, directly out of the, the pockets of taxpayers. We're not having to hike up taxes. We're not having to raise water and sewer rates to take that money from taxpayers to pay for these projects. And in the long term, it's gonna help balance things out. And in addition, we're not going into more debt to make these capital projects happen. Right. And that's what we're trying to avoid is getting more debt on top of what we already have. Right. Not to mention, we also wanna make sure that we have a healthy reserve fund because, you know, God forbid there's another recession at any point. We wanna be prepared to meet that. I mean, one of the reasons why, you know, we were able to weather the storm was because we had the reserves to rely on. Rather than having to astronomically raise rates, we were able to, to borrow to some degree from the reserves. Right. Well, our rates remain high, uh, Councilman Bigliotti, and we have the flexibility in, because of the surpluses we do have, 
in unrestricted all right. funds. Well, so well again, we, we, we're, we're rediscussing the same thing that has been discussed at our budget <laughs> workshop and settled. And so we don't need to take time high. to do that right now, but uh, you can make any motion you want to on Monday night regarding the water and sewer rates. And if you get a majority, it'll move forward. If you don't, it won't. I'd, I'd like to have some discussion with my peers about the actual numbers, but we can do that on Monday if you'd rather do that. Would you be so kind as also to distribute the questions that you have for the city manager to the rest of us so that we are also privy to that information? I think that's reasonable. Let me ask Jim. I just got those to you today. Will you be able to get some answers of those by Monday, or is that something? We good certainly one? should. I, I am not going to promise that we'll have answers to everything by Monday, but we'll give it our best shot. And I was going to suggest that um, what we'll do is go through question by question. We'll insert the response under each question that you posed. And uh, I think it would be helpful for discussion would purposes be really Monday helpful. night if we copied all the council members and the mayor. Okay. Um, responses so that you're all on the same page for discussion come Monday night. I think emotionally um, there's right. concern about some capital projects, but we don't really know what those projects are yet uh, by name. We had a pre presentation from the former manager of a $60 million capital plan, but we don't. One of the questions I'm addressing is what are the priorities and which priorities and what's the cost of each. And so I think that'll help you, Joe. And uh, and I think you'll see that this is a good year for adduction. I think if you look well, at your budget packet, you'll find exactly what you're asking for because right, it was given to all out. of us. Yeah, but we went over in detail. In, in very detail. And it wasn't just this year. It was going out. How many years does that say? Uh, six, six years. years. Six years. Six I mean, years. It, it shows exactly what we're looking at and what the costs are and priorities and all of it. All those questions have been answered I'm to sorry, that effect. Sorry you missed that. It's there. So just just before, we, uh, before we move on, the question came up at the budget workshop uh, with regard to the last payment for the wastewater treatment plant uh, biological nutrient removal upgrade. And that payoff, that amount was 231646 and 52 cents. So that was our, our Could final you say payment. That, that, is, that is now paid off. But that was what, just number one since more time? we last talked. That was, that was what we paid in the previous budget year, the current budget year. OK. Jim, could you give me that number one more time? I'm sorry. 231 646 52. 231 646 52. Thank you. Yes. All right. Also, Ordinance 05 2019 will be for introduction. That's the tax rate for fiscal year 2019. Any questions on that? Well, I'd just like to repeat at a public meeting that. The town is flush with funds because of the growth that's here, and um, property tax local rates are high. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars more than I expected they would be. And um, this is a good year for tax relief because of all the growth that's been allowed and all the hookups we've had. And, uh, and uh, in South Carroll, a massive increase in property tax assessments has just come through and many complaints to the governor. Some people's homes in South Carroll, because we have triennial assessments, were increased in the assessed value by 40%. There were loud shrieks of horror in South Carroll. We're in a cycle where in the future, Tony Town is going to have to be reassessed by the state assessment department. And, it's t and, well, I, and I, our I, rates remaining the same I, may result in a major windfall for the city if we don't well, take if, a realistic look at what the tax if, rate is on real estate. If that occurs, then we can look at it. But because well, it certainly has occurred because in South that, Carol, because that is my business, I can assure you we won't have 40 percent assessment. Are you increase. aware of what's happened in South Carroll? because of triennial assessments? I'm only aware of what happened that happens yeah. in Tawnytown, and we haven't gone up 40% in property values. Well, the state assessments uh, in, in South Carroll are on a triennial basis since the Beck Bill passed the legislature in the 1980s. Only a third of the people's assessments go up every time they do assessments. And that, so that, that's our wonderful time is them. That's wonderful for them, isn't it? Well, our time is coming in Tawnytown. And people are going to see substantial real estate. How would you like it if somebody estate. said, 
your house is worth 40% more than it was last well, year. Would those you like that? That, all, that lost their homes in South Carroll because of it. Would you like that? Yeah, that may happen to us that. is what I'm saying. I wish somebody to tell future me future assessments. So I'm trying to figure out. So you're saying we should cut yeah, our tax true. rates now in case Just assessments in case go happens. up in three years. If it's true that the city is flush with funding. I wouldn't say we're flush should, with funding. You should take a look at it. That's what I'm saying. Well, say, my, my peers on the council should be realistic know, about that. We, we, we have these never, never land scenarios every, every time we gather and we, we hear the councilman talk about these things that just oh, aren't accurate. Well, it certainly and we, accurate. The only thing we can deal with we have is what assessments. we have on paper and what we have decided to do as a group, as a council, to move forward. There'd be nobody, nobody would, would, would be happier if in good faith we could lower the tax rate, lower the water rate, lower the sewer rate, I'd love to do that. But it's not, it's not smart business. It's not good for the citizens to do that. What, what you get in, in monetary gratification for a year or two will come back and bite you in three or four. And that's, that's not responsible governing. All right, let's move on to... That's the opinion of the mayor. The uh, ordinance 01-2019. That will be up for adoption. That's the budget amendment for this year's budget that we talked about yes. last time. If I can call to your attention, on the table tonight was a, a sheet that looks like this with a couple pink bars. Please replace the uh, grayscale sheet that was in your packets, page two of the ordinance. Um, that was an older version of the worksheet. So the one that, that should be in there has the uh, the reclass of the Robert Smill uh, <clears throat> stormwater project to streets for the O'Brien Avenue Bridge, that project. So that, that was omitted on the copy in your packet. So, just so we're all looking at the same one for Monday night. And our usual resolution uh, for the water allocation this time for, uh, I guess that should be Mark, shouldn't it? Um, Blair resolution 2019-03, water allocation for March rather than February. My agenda says February. Do you have any question on that? All right, how about the city manager's report? Jim, what do you have for us tonight? Okay, a um, couple updates. Uh, Hopefully, uh, the mayor and I will be meeting with the Sewells uh, one day next week. We have a, a pending meeting, just trying to nail down the date. Uh, they've been working with uh, CLSI, Carol Land Services, on a concept plan that they'd like to, to share and get some feedback, uh, see if they're heading in the right direction. Um, so hopefully, we'll have some news on that uh, next month. Uh, the Syrian property, uh, been in touch with with them again uh, there there's going to be a survey involved in delineating the 4.4 acres that we need and that that cost was not projected in the twenty two thousand dollars that we had talked about and I'm not sure at this point if when we talked about not to exceed twenty two thousand if that was the per acre cost or if that was the intended to be the entire cost of the project so we're negotiating on that, but um, even at um, the 22,000 strictly for the land purchase, uh, that still is a very, very good price per acre um, for the property. It's uh, all, all the evidence so far is suggesting that that, that price is, is, a, is a deal for that acreage. So, but hopefully we'll have some more detail very soon on that. Um, Nothing new on the uh, charter and code, just have not had an opportunity to touch that. <clears throat> I do want to call to your attention um, something in the uh, DPW report this month. Um, we're adding a, a mixer to one of the tanks at the treatment plant that we're hoping will um, allow us to reclaim more of the magnetite. Uh, you may recall that we've, we've had to purchase that more frequently than was originally envisioned with the new system. Uh, and we've realized that we, we believe it's settling in this one tank that does not have a mixer. 
Uh, so we're going to add one and hopefully we'll be able to reclaim more of that magnetite by keeping things stirred up in the tank um, rather than it settling around the edges of the tank. That seems to be where, a lot, where we're losing a lot of the magnetite and then we can't reclaim it to use again. So we're hoping that by investing in a, a mixer, we'll save some money in the long run by reducing our consumption on the magnetite. Um, and just also wanted to call to your attention, uh, there were two pages in your packet this month um, for the capital equipment uh, budget. We, we have a police page now that we didn't have with the draft from the workshop night. And also we corrected the um, capital equipment for the streets uh, with regard to the dump truck price. And also there was initially a utility truck in there that we took out after having a conversation with the mayor on the initial budget review. Uh, Public Works had hoped to add an additional staff person for FY20, and in talking with the mayor, we agreed to defer that for FY21. Um, so rather than take that truck out and the salt spreader that goes with it, we just pushed it back to 21, and we'll revisit that with next year's budget. So, so that was in your packet as well. Can I ask a question right here, Mr. Mayor? Sure. While we're still with this report. On police vehicles, I noticed that they're scheduled, there's a schedule for replacement and purchase of new vehicles. I don't believe our police vehicles are involved in high speed chases and that sort of thing. So I think that we should look at mileage instead of age as far as these vehicles before we go for replacement. We could save a substantial amount of money if vehicles are well maintained by allowing them to accrue. Um, a reasonable amount of mileage instead of just going every so many years we have to upgrade and replace vehicles it's right yeah. it's it looks from my review that the, all the requests for vehicles have to do with the age not the yes. mileage of the vehicles I couldn't find any that, that is they they're rotated out based By on age. based on age and, yes, and I'm not that sure is, that's a good idea um, because vehicles can run on reasonable use, a lot more miles before we have to replace them. So how many miles do our police cars put on in a year? I don't know that okay. statistic, but I do know that if we don't ever look at it, we'll never know what well, the mileage of these vehicles I see you have this nice paper here. What does that say about miles per year? I'm looking, uh, maybe you can show me. What is that you want to see? I was looking at that, that was on our, on our desk tonight. It says, let's see. Vehicles are rotated out by age, not by mileage. And I was going to suggest that we might well, think that. I think that really goes one in the same. I mean, as, as you use the vehicles, as they get older, they use more miles. I mean, they're going to have more miles put on them. It's a, a constant line that you're going to see on a graph. I told Larry Hildebreit, we have a 1938 Ford Coupe in the barn that has 13,000 miles on it. So um, the fact is that the, the age of the vehicle is not the right measure of whether or not the vehicle needs to be replaced. What we oh, don't, count. but what we don't know, the information we don't have right now before we even make that decision is how many miles are put on them when we retire the how car. How many miles do they have? And, and there's a very good chance that they have 200,000 plus miles on them. And oh. for a police car, you need something that you know will be reliable. And when you start getting to that level, you're gonna have degrada degradation of performance significantly. Right, you're not, yeah. even, yeah, though this is, even though the town is only a couple of miles long by a couple of miles wide, these guys aren't just sitting in a parking lot. They're actively pursuing stuff. If you look at the mileage total sheet, right, for January and February alone, so far this year, the cars have driven 26,188 miles. Right. And so that's when you look that. at it over the course of years, it builds up. And that's, that's just for two months this year. So phasing them out, as Councilman Wan said, by age, you know, there's degradation that occurs over time. I mean, this is not, you know, I'm not trying to be insulting. This is not a car sitting in a barn somewhere. I mean, these cars are being actively used on a daily and nightly basis. The other part of this is that a lot of the, uh, a lot of what is untold is a lot of this is idling miles. I mean, right. they, 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 they spend as much time idling as they do driving. So if you have a, a vehicle that, the changes out after six years, and it's got 130,000 miles on it. It's probably got 260,000 miles on it because of the when you count the idling cost on it. So this has been examined over the course of time, and um, 
I'm not saying it shouldn't be looked at. It, everything should be looked at periodically to see if we're still thinking the same way. But uh, I know when, in past years we've had this discussion and, and it was uh, to our benefit, the city's benefit, to, to, to rotate these cars on a periodic basis rather than uh, wait till they break and then replace them. We do track the, the maintenance costs Maybe we can get that you know, for, for all the vehicles in the fleet, you know, both public works and police vehicles. And based on the, the, the maintenance costs as the vehicles age, that's how, how we've established the age at which we typically retire the vehicles. Uh, it, with regard to the police vehicles, there's, there is tremendous variety in the um, mileage, you know, at the point where they are retired because we do retire them based on age for the police fleet. Um, well, public works as well, but it's a, a longer lifespan for the public works vehicles. Um, and in talking with um, Acting Chief Etzler, there, of course, is the maintenance factor that as the vehicle ages and the miles accumulate, we spend more on maintenance um, and also the value, the resale value of the cars diminishes. So, you know, we think we're at a good point where we're getting out of the vehicles where there's some residual value and also before we start incurring more maintenance costs. But also, it, safety features in the vehicles are advancing so rapidly as well that that's another factor that, you know, leads to the, that wants us to replace the police vehicles a little quicker uh, just because the nature of, of how they're driven. Now, you know, we don't have a, there are very few, uh, cases in which we pursue, where we would do high speed pursuit, you know, there are very limited situations where we would do that through town. Um, so that's not like, a, you know, it's not like you see on television all the time. Um, so they don't get that kind of use, but there's a lot of idling, um, you know, and a lot of, of um, more intense use perhaps than uh, your family vehicle might have. So. We think, we think we're, we're hitting a good point with that age of the vehicles when we retire them. Um, but certainly we, we keep collecting the data, you know, review it periodically. So maybe a few years from now we may determine that one, it's time for a change. One thing I do that's very unscientific, but something that I do religiously, is I sign the checks for uh, the city every week. I always uh, note any repairs that any vehicle, both either utility vehicle or the police vehicles, occur. And I'll, I got a little legal pad and I write it down what it is, the date it is, and how much it costs. And if I see one vehicle or another that is um, unusual as far as maintenance cost goes, I, I always question that. So it's, uh, it's, it's something that I'm very much aware of and very much focused on. And um, we had a couple of vehicles just that we just got out of the fleet the last two years that were actually costing us a fortune. They were absolutely incredibly expensive. They were two uh, 2008 Impalas. I don't know whether it was a bad year or what, but they were really, really <laughs> ate us alive. But uh, now we've got a couple of Dodges that are falling in that category. So, but they're but they're on the uh, they're on the high end of the. Of the scale, they're going to get ready, getting ready to get ro ro rotated <clears throat> out. But that's that's just what happens. They're mechanical equipment. But it's very much aware. It's something I'm very much aware of, and it's something that I'd be very open to talk about further with people who knew about this kind of stuff. I mean, if we just we don't know that about this kind of stuff. We're not automotive engineers. We gotta listen to the experts. All right. Oh, Mayor, just just one last very brief thing. I just want to compliment Jim. Uh, over the course of the last couple of days, I've had a number of citizens who have been in contact with me with uh, with certain concerns. For example, uh, construction traffic going down the wrong street and kind of you know stirring up the neighborhood. And and I asked for assistance uh, from our acting city manager on that, and he took care of it immediately. So I want to compliment him for his professionalism and his efficiency. Thank you, Jim. Uh, any questions for Jim further? Any question on the department reports? All right, how about the legal report? Jay, what do you have for us? 
just two things to give you updates on. The first, they both deal with the Board of Zoning Appeals. The Board of Zoning Appeals held their hearing last night on the Meads Crossing uh, variants for their setbacks on their townhomes, decks, the rear yard setbacks, and that was granted uh, without issue. And then to give you an update, I know I did this, uh, I kind of told you about it before, but now it's official. The Board of Zoning Appeals decision regarding the Blaine Mar case, which is the Old Sheets case, has been appealed. Um, and what that means is that the, after we issued the opinion, uh, anybody who's interested can appeal, and the appeal is to circuit court. So the Exxon, that's not the proper legal term, but the Exxon property and the uh, liquor barn, I think it's called, out in the shopping center, they are the petitioners for the appeal. And um, so there is quite a um, process involved with what has to happen with this appeal. This is, it's not, first thing you need to know, it's not quick. So uh, it's gonna be at least a 60 day process. The city has to provide transcripts of the entire hearing and all the case files, turn that into the circuit court. And then the petitioner requires a brief. They have 30 days to do that. And then the respondents, which is gonna be the actual owners of the property or the operators, uh, the city is also a respondent. We need to enter our appearance to be respondents because we have to defend the Board of Zoning Appeals. So that's 30 days after that. And then uh, there will be a hearing. So you're talking nine months or so before this thing gets to that point. So we're in the very initial stages and it's gonna go from there. Um, and there's really not much more that can be done. However, the action that was taken to approve the liquor store at that place is not stayed. The, unless the petitioner asks the court to have a motion to stay this and they argue whether it is, they can still proceed at their own risk, which is what my understanding they've done. They've come in for their permits to continue to open and to do, do their thing. They also received approval from the liquor board, the Carroll County Liquor Board, to actually transfer their license from wherever it was to here. So my understanding is the applicant is moving ahead despite this is going on. So this will be another legal drama playing out for the next 10 months. Before we leave the report, can I just ask that you refresh us a little bit? An applicant came for the use of the sheets to, to, um, uh, to open a liquor store. Is that correct? And the old sheets property. And our Board of Zoning Appeals denied it. Is that correct? No, they, they denied it. And then there was a motion to reconsider and the board reconsidered and says, yes, we'll reconsider. And then another hearing, an additional hearing was held, in which case they approved it. Okay, and why is there appeal of that? Because the Exxon and the liquor barn don't want another liquor store. Okay. I All didn't right. say that, but that's... That's good. Thank you for right. refreshing mm -hmm. that. All right. Any questions for Jay? <clears throat> old business move into new business any question on the financial report nope mm -mm. sir any question on the accounts payable so i have a question on that i always review these the way you do mr mayor you say you sign these checks and review each one that's a that's a great privilege to have that the my understanding is that when we get these reports for checks that uh that they're already, um, the checks have already been signed and, and given out. If there's something that you didn't sign, would it be in this report? No, it doesn't appear on that ledger until the checks are drawn or, or created. Uh, I, I just looked at the legal fees for November and December. I've been chided before on the council saying we spend too much on legals. How much is available in the budget for spending on legal fees? Councilman, what you have a copy of the budget, you can look it up. I don't recall. Well, the invoice for this for these three months is over thirty thousand dollars. Did you sign that check already? I did. But it was I Can I get was, some I explanation of what? It was four month services. Thirty four thousand four hundred and thirty two dollars and fifty cents. Yeah. Um, for what six thousand in in um, December, seventeen thousand in January and 10,000 more in uh, November. For what did we spend this kind of money for? Uh, I'd like to answer that if I could. Well, yeah, I, 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 
Because you're, you're, you're very predictable, so I'm prepared for you. Good, I would like um, to know. Uh, $150 so, an hour, that's a lot of time. Here's the story with that. Uh, I broke down the fees just so you could make it, you know, we could make it personal and understand since you like to make it personal with me. Yeah, that's you paid me money. for three months $34,000, and I broke that out based on the time that I spent. To give you an understanding, I spent 14% of that time dealing with the Board of Zoning Appeals and the developers, which pay back the city for that cost. So 14% of that. However, between the Catherine Adelaide trial, which spent 15% of my time that those periods, and the matters dealing with the Frasers, which include the lawsuit that your wife has and the appeal that's going on, that includes the code violations, the multiple open meeting complaints that had to be defended, and the Public Information Act requests regarding your emails, I spent 18% of my time dealing with those matters that regard the Frasers. So if you add the Catherine Adelaide and the Frasier matter together, you get 33% of that time that I spent was on that. And so if I that never can had tell a chance to that, vote on whether or not we would prosecute a person for speaking 90 seconds longer than you guys That's uh, like. not my, my problem Boom. at we all. We never had a chance to vote on whether or not you'd pursue that. You're talking so about none of the that payments. Would accrue to, to, uh, would mm -hmm. accrue to the city making a decision to chase her for that. Well, the reality is a third of my time over the last three months have been spent on things that you are involved in. You should quit violating the open meetings law. You've done it again on the 9th of February. Well, I'm not a member of the board, so if anybody violates it, you would be one of them. No, I vote against these secret meetings. Mm. They're not I voted secret against meetings. the one on February the 9th, I think. How, they're however, not secret meetings, and then you attend them anyways because they're so well, secret. Well, I did attend the one because you chose the police chief, which you shouldn't have done that in a, in a closed session. Anyway, you can see oh. that at All least right. I was prepared to we're, explain we're that. We're degraded. We're, de we're digressing. You cannot digressing. That's make the policy <laughs> decisions in a closed meeting like that. Mr. Mayor, you're wrong about that. Let me, and, and all right, trouble well, now. again, it's, uh, your, your never, never land way of looking at things. We have been convicted five times of breaking the open meetings law. <laughs> not been convicted. We, 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 we have been exonerated five certainly times. certainly have not. What are you talking about? We don't appeal something. There were seven something. counts. Tony we don't appeal something. We have, something we have never won. had a guilty verdict against five us. Five counts. Never, ever. You don't appeal something that you've won, number one. And number two, Jay provides excellent legal services for us. I, I could not even begin to imagine, for example, right, the amount of time that he has had to spend going through small cell legislation on our behalf. I think a lot of time was spent on that. If, well, right. So why would you be surprised when there are high legal $34, fees? $34,000 Not to mention the fact for legal. that he, I'm not sure that's inside this. As I've mentioned before, he charges us a lower rate than anybody else as a favor to us. The, the 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 issue with with what someone gets paid really isn't our business. Well, I want to vote no on it. That's a, too much money for legal advice. I think that we have a sense of the law. We don't need him to attend every meeting. We certainly don't sense need him law. to prosecute yes. people yes. who spend yes. 90 seconds too long. So we treat So we have a sense of the law, but a couple of minutes ago you accused us of multiple violations, secret meetings, any number of wrongs. You accused you. Judge Daniels convicted you. <laughs> okay, well, you that's don't. false. So I, if, if you can't even get that right, I don't think Were you have a sense of any law. Were we ever convicted of anything? No, we won every case so far with well, that. That's what I thought. I just I didn't think I was confused. Oh, All right, can we move on, Mr. Mayor? All right. Let's move on to um, public comments pertaining agenda items. Anyone have any public comments pertaining items that appeared on the agenda? Same rules apply. There's Marvin. Marvin flicking at 80 Spalmer Street. A little tidbit. It was brought up in your discussions about the water tires. I can remember years ago when the newest water tire was built. There was a lot of discussion on it as to how tall it would be and how many gallons it would hold, the shape of it, the aesthetics of it, to paint it, to put it, uh, match the sky or to try to match the sky. And guess what happened? Now, Tawny Town's water tire, as well as around the country, look like trees growing out of the top. That's true. Oh, uh, I got a pamphlet here on the bypass. Do you know anything about this? It was handed to me at the meeting. 
Nope, we've not seen it. Well, I was going to have some comments on that, but if it's, I'm not going to discuss it. No idea what it is. M Marvin, could you, would you be so kind as to get us a copy of that? Oh, thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? I just wanted to, uh, Robin Frazier, Bentley Street, um, speak to the ordinance on the um, 5G. And I don't have any particular problem with aesthetics or anything like that. It doesn't bother me. But what I am a little bit concerned about that is, hasn't been discussed is um, health and safety effects. Um, you may know that I uh, work for a company, uh, do consulting, that works with protecting infrastructure from electromagnetic pulse. And um, there is some question about whether these um, stands that will be so um, close to each other, and so many of them, do not present a health problem uh, in the community. And um, although I don't think government should deal with aesthetics or whether somebody markets their product on somebody's property or not, I do think that there's a time when government should step in if there's a health and safety concern in the community. And um, I know I. I'm sure because it's a, a federal level or something, they, they're sort of brushing that off. But I would like to ask that um, some kind of investigation will be done into the health and safety of these and if there's anything that we can do to uh, slow this down until we have an understanding of that. Um, I'm not sure exactly where you need to go to do that. I know there's studies and there's um, uh, well, again, the legislature information being driven that you by can the look FCC. Up. It's been a it's, it's being being it's coming down through us through the federal government, and we're we're adapting accordingly. I don't know that there's any uh, thing we can do before April 15th at all on this. I think we're we're, we're the, the we're the line is at the gate. We've got we've got to do something to protect our citizens right now. Now, if if indeed there are health concerns that arise in the future, then certainly we'll investigate them. Absolutely. Well, maybe I can bring some information because I think that um, there should be some resistance if there is a health problem. I mean, we're talking, you know, cancer causing. And um, I think there are studies at, uh, like at the airports where they're using some of the same type of technology where the folks working there are having health problems. Okay. Well, I think, so I think that I, means that's the kind of thing problem. I'd like you all to fight for me for is health and safety issues, we'll, not aesthetics. We'll, we'll certainly Thank need you. someone more attuned to things like that than we are to be able to bring but it's certainly, what, if it's a public health concern, we're, it's concerned to me. Anyone else? Barbara Heltebrottle, 435 East Baltimore Street. I would like to talk about Ordinance 04 and Ordinance 05, the water and sewer rate and the tax rate. I would urge you to please pass that Monday night because as a taxpayer, I appreciate you are not raising taxes or our water and sewer rate. I understand why. And I know a lot of people feel the same way I did when I saw it in the paper and I've talked to a lot of neighbors and different people and they say, hallelujah, you know, our taxes aren't going to be raised, our water rate's going to stay the same. So I would urge you please to pass it Monday. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else? I will give you a quick explanation of this drawing I made of the 60-year-old bypass. I got a map from downstairs from the girls down there. I pulled out all the say, buildings and the side streets so that it gave a quick overview of how it affects the city. 
And then on the second page, I have some pros and cons about the bypass. Thank you, Barbara. Anyone else? Bless you. All right, can I get a motion to adjourn? Do we need to go into a closed session? So moved. Second. Second. All favor say aye. Can, can we, um, can you read the statement at the bottom right, of the agenda? I would, I would like to adjourn and to close session pursuant to section 3-305B3 of the general provisions of the article the Maryland Annotated Code to consider the acquisition of real property for the purpose and the matters directly related to that acquisition. The Maryland City Council will not reconvene in public session <coughs> after the closed meeting. And can then you and, read the statement? And uh, further, um, the purpose um, is to uh, consider the acquisition of real property for the pr public purpose and matters directly related thereto. And uh, we'll be dealing with citation 3-305B3, acquisition of real property. Uh, and the reason uh, for the closed session is to discuss and decide on negotiating strategy for an ongoing negotiation to acquire real property for the public purpose by the city. Did I miss anything? Nope. Now you can make your motion. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded. Okay. And now discussion. Any discussion? I think that's a reasonable thing to discuss that. We can't, that can't be public. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed like sign. So carried. Thank you, folks. We'll reconvene in five minutes or five so. Five minutes. That's great. <laughs>